Mr. Gonzalez, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview and welcome to Taiwan um, once again. Um, let me begin by asking you um, about the United Nations. How long have you been at the UN? I started at the UN in late 2007, um, November, December 2007. So this is my fifth year mm -hmm. at, at the UN now. And what has the experience been like? How has it been different from what you expected it to be? Well, I think whenever you start at the UN, um, you start with a little bit of uh, idealism, uh, a little bit of naivety, that you think um, you think you can change the world to a certain extent. Um, you know you know you can't. You, you have this sort of uh, naivety that um, things will move at a different pace than they actually do. And you also think sometimes that everybody thinks like you. So you get to learn very quickly the diversity of perspectives of other countries and the diversities of interests. Very often, just because something isn't important to send these to the Grenadines, it might be a life or death matter to another country. So you learn that when you have 192, now 193 countries, um, there's, there are many different nuances that you have to take into account. And you also appreciate uh, how difficult it is to get the majority of the countries in the world to agree on any one thing. So um, I think I have a greater appreciation for the diversity involved, the difficulty involved in getting change at the international level, at the multilateral level. But I expected that it would be difficult. I expected that we'd have a lot of negotiations to do. I expected that it would be a challenge for a small country to get its voice heard consistently. And I think uh, to a great extent, we have been successful in having our voice heard, in being respected in the international community as a voice of principle. And I also think that through my own limited efforts and the efforts of my staff, we have been able to get also a few direct benefits for the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I'm, I'm very proud of the work that the mission has done in the four and a half, five years that I've been there. Um, every so often coming out of the UN, we get some very positive reports about you um, when you chair committees and that kind of stuff. But as I'm sure you know, when you were when you were first appointed as a permanent representative to the United Nations in Saint Vincent and the Grenadines, there were a lot of people who were critical of that appointment, and some of them felt that your appointment was an act of nepotism. Um, do you think that you've been able to win over based on your performance those persons? Well, I don't know. I mean, you'd probably have to ask them. I mean, there were some people who had some very pointed remarks. Uh, at the time that I accepted the post. I always felt that I was qualified for the position. Um, and I understand the nature of politics in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, that it, it, it's almost a foregone conclusion that if I'm given a position, offered a position, if I take a position in the government, um, there will be those who criticize it. I always was very confident of my abilities to perform. I think that I have performed creditably uh, as the permanent representative. Um, so you'd really have to ask them um, whether or not if they think I have done a good job. Um, I honestly don't think this was an act of nepotism. Um, yes, I am related to the Prime Minister, I'm his son. But I believe then, as I believe now, that I'm qualified for the position both in terms of my qualifications and my experiences, uh, my temperament, my ideology, my understanding of the government's positions. So I never thought that it was an act of nepotism. If I did, I wouldn't have taken the position. I'm not in a position that I have to rely on uh, nepotism to, to get a job or to get ahead. Um, so I don't think personally that I was affected by that. I understand that it's a claim made and this is the, the nature of politics. But whether or not I have satisfied my critics, um, I don't think it's a question that I can answer. Okay, what do you think um, are the major accomplishments of yourself and your staff at the U United Nations on behalf of St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Well, there, there are a number of different types of responsibilities that you have. In terms of um, 
increasing the profile of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Uh, I think the, the number one achievement would have been when the St. Vincent and the Grenadines host, uh, was the co-chair of the conference on the financial crisis. If you think about the last five years in international uh, economics and diplomacy, the main issue, number one or number two, would be the financial crisis. We're still experiencing the impacts of the financial crisis in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You, you're hearing what's happening in Europe on a daily basis. The financial crisis was one of the defining features of the last five years and indeed of the last 50 years. And when the United Nations decided to confront the financial crisis, they asked St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, to be one of the co-chairs. And I think that is the, the signature achievement in terms of raising the profile of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But in addition to that, uh, many people criticize the, the United Nations as a do-nothing body and it needs to be reformed and revitalized. Again, the president of the General Assembly asked St. Vincent and the Grenadines to co-chair uh, an ad hoc working group on the revitalization of the General Assembly. In, on the issues of law of the sea, we're an island state. St. Vincent and the Grenadines served as president of the last uh, meeting of the law of the sea body of the United Nations. So in those issues, raising the profile of the country, high profile events, uh, I think we've done a lot of that. Uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines has also spoken uh, in debates, in formal proceedings, a lot more than it had done hitherto. And I think that our consistent speaking on matters of importance um, from a position of principle has also raised the profile of the country and the respect that the country has gotten. Um, our entry... Uh, as a candidate for the Security Council for 2020, um, which is still on track and it's a long process. Um, that is also something that has never been done by St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and that's another indication of the, the profile. So, so, so in terms of raising our name, in terms of injecting ourselves into the debate, those are things that I'm very proud of. That's one side of it. In terms of material benefits, to the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Our mission has been integrally involved in the One Laptop Per Child program. Um, we did a great deal of work uh, coordinating between and among the governments of Portugal and Venezuela and getting the, the, the pieces in place for that to be implemented. I'm exceedingly proud of that. The last time I went to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I went to the beach in Bekwe and I saw some little boys on the beach with their laptops and they were begging somebody um, for a charge because their battery was low and they were they were going from one place to the other trying to catch a, a hotspot a wi-fi hotspot so they could serve and these children were seven eight years old and they were not children of means and i was so proud that i had something to do with not the fact that they just had laptops but the fact that they were being introduced to a world that they would not have had an opportunity to be a part of, if not for that program. That's apart from the what they're doing with them in school and so on. Just, just seeing that was, was something that was incredibly rewarding to me. So there's the laptop programs. Um, in terms of disaster assistance, uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines was struck by floods uh, and by a hurricane. For the first time, we brought a resolution to the General Assembly calling on the international community to assist us. St. Vincent has never authored a resolution in the, in the United Nations before. The governments of Qatar, of Georgia, of Pakistan, of Azerbaijan, um, a number of countries donated in excess of a million dollars um, to help St. Vincent and the Grenadines recover from the floods and, and the hurricane. Very proud of that. Um, airport, the international airport at Argyle. We have facilitated a number of meetings. Either we directly have negotiated money for the airport, or we have put the Prime Minister in a position to negotiate directly for money for the airport. But we have laid the groundwork, or we have done the follow-up work. And, and this, the follow-up or the groundwork is sometimes as important 
as when the two leaders sit down across the table and agree on these things. And so we have also helped to direct large sums of money uh, to, to the effort to build the International Airport at Argyle. So you have, you have disaster relief, you have education, you have the International Airport. Um, very proud of those as well. And I think it's a long list, but I think those would be our signature achievements uh, at the UN. So um, let, let's change the conversation a little. Now I want to talk about Taiwan. What is it that brings you to Taiwan this time? Well, as you know, Kenton, living here in Taiwan, President Ma was just re-elected. And I came here as a, as a part of a three-ambassador team to Taiwan, the first group of ambassadors to visit President Ma post re-election. And one of the central reasons that uh, President Ma wanted to see us was that he wanted to discuss with us the the policies that he has undertaken in terms of his cross-strait relationships. As you would know, the previous administration uh, of, of President Chen had a more confrontational approach to China when it came to cross-strait relations. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines and all of Taiwan's allies were at the forefront of calling for Taiwan's independence and membership in the United Nations. President Ma had a different approach. He wanted to have what he calls variable diplomacy and have a more conciliatory approach to China. This last election was the first opportunity that the people of Taiwan had to pronounce on this change in policy. And President Ma was re-elected. He wanted to discuss with us his interpretation of the election results, what it meant for the future of cross-strait relations, and how he sees how he would like his allies to assist him in the implementation of this variable diplomacy. You see, it, it was almost easier uh, under the previous administration. We would go to the General Assembly, we would bang the table, and we would say Taiwan has to be a part of this assembly. But now President Ma's approach is far more subtle and far more nuanced. So we have to have a consistent engagement with the international community to make sure that Taiwan has the ability to participate meaningfully. So that was one part of it. He also wanted to stress that he values his, Taiwan's relationships with its allies even more now in this new dispensation and that all previous commitments would be honored in the same manner. That was the meeting with President Ma, which set the broad framework. But we've also had the opportunity to meet with a number of ministers. I met today with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We discussed Taiwan's uh, work on the international airport. I met with the, the, the head of the agency that deals with international cooperation. And we, you will hear announcements in, in the very near future about new areas of cooperation in agriculture, um, in microcredit to, to farmers. And, um, well, I don't want to steal any of the minister's thunder on these matters, but we, we have furthered some new agreements uh, in those areas and discussed new ways in which Taiwan and St. Vincent and the Grenadines can partner. Additional scholarships um, help with uh, renewable energy and other matters of technology, ICT training and the like. Um, we've met with the Mainland Affairs Council, we've met with the, Envi the Environmental Agency. Some of these things are meetings for them to ask us to help them. Can we help them participate more in the UN processes on climate change? Can we help them participate more in the World Health Organization? And in others, we are asking them for assistance. Can you assist us with this, and this, that, or the other thing? And um, there are three ambassadors there, so it's not just St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Taiwan. The, the ambassador of the Gambia is there, and the ambassador of the Dominican Republic is there. So there's a representative from Taiwan's African friends, from Taiwan's English-speaking Caribbean friends, and from Taiwan's Latin American friends. Uh, the only missing component is the, their Pacific Island friends. So a number of things, both the broad overarching framework of our relationship going forward, what it means, and also some specific bilateral issues that we're trying to advance. I understand that today you had a meeting with President Ma. 
What did President Ma have to say about the relationship between Taiwan and its Caribbean allies, specifically with the um, this diplomatic truce, this unofficial diplomatic yes. truce? Yes, President Ma did mention um, the 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 tacit agreement that that China and Taiwan have, essentially not to try to poach each other's allies. He did make reference to it. Um, it's not anything that the Chinese and the Taiwanese have written down, but they're trying to build trust with each other at this moment. And we appreciate that because clearly Taiwan and China, the cross-strait relation is a potential flashpoint for violence. And President Ma has decided to take a long view that it is, it is now the, the time that we must, that those two countries must build trust with one another. Um, so we don't anticipate the same sort of gamesmanship um, with one country trying to poach another country and the like. He did say, however, that just as Taiwan is engaged in business with mainland China, there is certainly no impediment, or he, does, he would not feel slighted if his allies engaged in business with mainland China. But he also made clear that we are even more important than we were before because in this rapprochement, he has to maintain the fact that Taiwan has international friends and allies that recognize him because in the negotiations that they engage with, Taiwan has to negotiate from a position of strength. And we are, we the allies of Taiwan, are part of that strength that they have. Countries that recognize them, countries that are willing to go to international fora to support them. Um, President Ma has also said that just because he's not raising the issue of independence, um, that does not mean that Taiwan does not want greater and more meaningful participation in the international community. And he has, he has asked us, his allies, to, to help him, to be a voice for him, for his country. Uh, to get this participation and to advise uh, the Taiwanese. Because, let's face it, it's been decades since Taiwan has been a part of the UN. And there are just some matters that they are not knowledgeable about in terms of that type of diplomacy. Um, well, they're knowledgeable, but we are more knowledgeable having, having been in it on a day-to-day -day basis. So what he essentially outlined was that we are still valuable, and he's going to be asking us to, to help him even more on a consistent basis. Um, and on the other side, that um, we should not feel that we cannot, that we will be slighting him if we engaged in business with China, as long as we maintain our recognition of Taiwan. But there's some people who are somewhat concerned about the relationship between um, China and Taiwan, the, the sort of rapprochement and the implications for um, Taiwan's Allies, how do you think that this stands to affect the relationship between Sinvis and the Greenies? To demand more, as it were, from the Taiwanese. Do, do you think that this is the case? I don't think that's the case. I think that there are some countries that have engaged in a very mercenary game with Taiwan and mainland China, where they try to play one off of the other. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, since independence, has been an ally of Taiwan. And we have not participated in those sorts of flirtations with mainland China. We think that we have a relationship that is built fairly solidly on principles and friendship. To those countries that think they could switch back and forth endlessly, maybe it will be damaging to them. But uh, we have a very strong relationship between, and we, we consider ourselves allies. So we don't think that that was the source of our support. Um, this is a new paradigm. And friends will become more or less important based on how strongly they advocate for Taiwan in other fora. Taiwan before just was talking about membership in the UN. And that was an annual rite of passage. You would go up there and you'd make the speech. Now Taiwan wants to be involved in the climate change processes. They want to discuss SARS and H1N1. They want to have a stronger presence in the World Trade Organization. They want to discuss civil aviation regulations. Uh, and the flights, the over the flights of their, their aircraft. And these are all international fora that their allies are going to have to go and advocate for them and try to get their membership in these fora. 
So we are in many ways more valuable to Taiwan. Now, you're right, and the commentator is probably right. We can't play off one or the other, but St. Vincent and the Grenadines never did that. So that was never, that was never something that was in our bag of tricks. So I don't think it will affect our country as it may affect some other countries. Two weeks ago, you were in Australia. What, what was the reason for that trip? Well, it was a part of a large group of ambassadors. Um, over 20 ambassadors went to Australia. Australia is trying to introduce the international community to the work that it is doing in peacekeeping and peace building, number one. And as we lead up to what is called Rio Plus 20, uh, a sustainable development conference, they want to show the developing countries what they have been doing in, in the furtherance of sustainable development. A few years ago, Australia was one of the countries that was opposed to any strong climate change deal. They've come around and they wanted to make that point clear. They also wanted to engage in some bilateral cooperation with some countries. Um, I can say, again, this will be reported by the proper authorities, but I can say that there's a scholarship program in place where Vincentian students who apply to Australian universities and are accepted to Australian universities are eligible to have their tuition, their room, their board, and their transportation paid for by the Australian government. Um, Australia was also inquiring. Australia gave us money uh, in the wake of the flooding. They were also inquiring as to whether or not we are fully recovered, whether we needed any additional assistance. And we, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, were trying to lay the groundwork uh, for future visits by higher level officials than myself to strengthen the bonds between Australia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We're in the Commonwealth. We share values, we share language, we share cricket, we share all kinds of things. But we have not been strong, as strong allies as probably we could be. So part of it was fact-finding, part of it was Australia introducing itself to parts of the world that it doesn't traditionally deal with. And part of it was us sort of putting the marker down that we would like to see stronger relations. But the headlines coming out of it was probably the, be the scholarships and um, some, some aid discussions that will be followed up by officials higher than myself. Okay. Um, I imagine that you are aware that two days ago, Prime Minister Gonzalez reshuffled his, his um, cabinet. Yeah. And some of the discussions that we've been hearing on the radio, and one of the names that, are in the, that is in the public sphere in St. Vincent is Camilo Gonzalez. And it is being said that you are being considered for the position of Minister of Foreign Affairs. Is there any truth to that? I, 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 I have not read that anywhere, so I don't know where, where you heard that. But no, I was not approached. Um, I am currently the permanent representative. Um, I was aware of the various cabinet reshuffle discussions because a newspaper had reported it, uh, had, had speculated about it earlier than it actually took place. It has taken place now, but at no point between that newspaper article and the actual shuffle, did anyone approach me and make me any part of any cabinet shuffle or, or any discussions about did, any cabinet shuffle? Did anybody approach you before the newspaper article? No, nobody. Is the, as far as I know, uh, which is the, the government was re-elected. The Honorable Minister Douglas Slater was made Foreign Minister. And that is it as far as I know. There's been no, there's been no attempt to, to woo me or anything like that uh, for that position. Although I'm, I'm very honored that you that you're saying my name was in discussion. But, what is, is, it was on radio in St. Vincent. But what I would like to ask you though is, if you were, if the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines were to ask you to become Minister of Foreign Affairs, <laughs> would you be inclined to accept such an appointment? <laughs> Kenton, um, the, 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 the new government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the re-elected government, is, is just over a year old. Um, it has just undergone uh, the first cabinet shuffle of that, that period. I think it is beyond premature, and I think it is disruptive for me to start speculating about if somebody offers me a, a ministerial post or if somebody doesn't. I was not offered one, and um, a reshuffle happened. And I think that this would be a really bad time for me to start saying, but however, if I am offered, I, I would take or I would not take. So I, I don't think it's an appropriate time for me to, to discuss that sort of a thing.
I think the last time I spoke to you, which was about four years ago in Taiwan, you told me that um, electoral politics, partisan politics, is something that you'd be open to. Also, you said last year on, on radio, around November, that if asked, that you would consider entering politics. Do you have any plans to enter electoral politics before 2015? Before 2015? Um, the short answer is no. I don't have plans. But I think it's early to be making those plans. Let me put it like this. As I just mentioned, the government is young, the new government. It has new ministers. Uh, it has a new shuffle, a new configuration. And I don't think it is appropriate for someone who is a member of the elected government, as I am, to start bandying about whether or not I am interested. Where, the, the questions that would naturally follow would be, where is he going to run? Who is he going to replace? And those, those, those sorts of questions, questions <laughs> those sorts of questions are, don't do any service to the government that I serve. Um, it would be incredibly selfish of me to start trying to inject myself into those sorts of conversations. And quite frankly, Kenton, even though you may hear it discussed on the radio and, and, and uh, political junkies like you and I might, want, might be asking these things, the man on the street in St. Vincent and the Grenadines isn't talking about Camilo Gonzalez and whether or not he, he, he should be running or not running. And this was the point that I was trying to make in that radio conversation earlier. People too often in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, put their ambition, their personal ambition, ahead of a substantive purpose in electoral politics. You hear people saying they want to be the youngest prime minister. You hear people saying they want to be the first woman prime minister. You hear people saying they want to be a left-handed prime minister or whatever. But have they told you their vision? Have they articulated a set a, a, an ideology or a philosophy for governance for how to move the country forward and if they have I, uh, if they have done that stated their philosophy have they then followed up and said these are the policies and programs that i would put in place to make that vision a reality nobody does that anymore people just say i want to be prime minister or i want to be a representative but representative to do what and i think the first step has to be somebody articulating a vision. And then the people having heard that vision say, I would like this man or this woman to represent me. So I think that here I am in New York for four years. How would it look for me to be up in my perch in New York saying, oh yes, I want to be, I want to be this or that. I, I think that is putting the cart before the horse. I think that the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines have to have a greater say in who their representatives are. And I don't mean on election day, because obviously they have the say then, but in choosing the people who should be competing for it. And we are far from that happening uh, in, in the case of any ULP uh, representative. The opposition party, having lost now three elections, they may come to that point earlier as they prepare themselves for the next election. They may have to, and I'm not trying to inject myself into their, how they operate, but they may come to the point where they have to think about reinvention or new leadership or new candidates and so on. I understand that some candidates who ran last year already know they will not be running in the next election um, because they're in opposition and they have to gear themselves up for that. But for for as a member of the party that is currently in government, um, I don't think that that is the process and that is not the time for that sort of thing. But I would, I, would, I would be more interested at this stage of the game to be discussing ideas. St. Vincent and the Grenadines is a small country with a lot of problems. And I would rather be talking across both sides of the, the political divide about how we move the country forward in a way that we can all agree on rather than which individual should be doing this or that or the other in furtherance of their own individual ambitions. Because when you do that, Kenton, if you, if you state your ambition, but you don't bring anything to back your ambition up in terms of an ideology, a philosophy, a program, a policy, then what you get into 
is just drawing down the other person because the other person is, a com is competing for your ambition. And then what you get is what we have, a very divisive political atmosphere where people tear down one another, but there are precious little programs and policies being discussed. Just, I think that's a bad idea, I think he's stupid, I think he lied, I think she whatever. And that, that, is, that is something that we have to move beyond, I believe. And, and um, so I wouldn't want to inject myself into that sort of a discussion at this time. Um, I think I, I have a job, I'm doing the job. If the time comes that, that my name is put forward or I put my name forward, um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But I don't think there's any clamor for a decision from me at this point. And I think that there are far more important issues to be discussing in the second year of a five-year term that will be running in 2015. Okay, you said that, <clears throat> well, on the one hand, you're saying that if asked, you would, you would consider it's something that you're open to. And on the other hand, you're saying that you think that people should present their ideas and then people would decide whether I want this person to become a representative. How do we re reconcile the two? Well, it's not difficult to reconcile. I don't think there's any state... Like I said, I'm, and I'm speaking now as, as a supporter of the, the incumbent party. There is no clamor now. And there will be no clamor now for any, anybody to ask anybody to run in the next couple of years. Because the election is in, let us assume, in 2015. Um, so putting the electoral machinery in place is not something that is is the focus of the government right now. The focus of the government is governing. Now, the opposition, which would like to depose the government, quite naturally, they have to focus more, more urgently on their own electoral fortunes. So, the, the question, will you come and represent, I believe, is years down the road. And if it is years down the road, there are plenty of, there's plenty of time for ideas or philosophies or programs to come into play. I think the man on the street in St. Vincent might know my name, but he might know my name more because of the fact that I am the son of the Prime Minister. Yes, I have been the permanent representative and I've, I believe I've done some good work, but I don't know how much that that is something occupying the mind of people on a day-to-day -day basis. So, I think I have a record that will that people will come to know they may or may not find it attractive. And they may or may not make decisions about whether they see something in me in that regard. But I honestly don't feel that this is, this is some sort of an imminent decision that has to be made, uh, either by me or by the people. And um, I think that we have other things to better focus our time on. We can't just lurch from election to election. We have to govern in the meantime. And, and that's what I'm focused on right. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador <laughs> Gonzalez. All, right. All right, Kenta. No problem. <laughs> Thanks a lot.